This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Troy Duffy, man. How are you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We're on, we're on our way. That felt good. We, like we haven't been talking for a half an hour. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, just, it's fresh, baby. It's fresh. It's fresh. I'm a professional, sir. Now, um, listen, man, I am, I'm so grateful that you uh, wanted to come on the show. And, and I've been a huge fan of yours, man, uh, because you are one of those stories, man. You are, the, you are one of those stories that uh, you tell filmmakers to scare them at, at the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, you know, and I heard this story when I was coming because you and I are of similar vintage. So we were mm-hmm. coming up around the same time. So anytime, and and I've said this a thousand times on the show, man, the '90s was a crazy time to be an independent filmmaker, and it was these all these kind of crazy stories were coming up, and it was the rise of Miramax and the the man who shall not be named, which we'll discuss later, and all of that kind, of, <laughs> and all of all of that kind of stuff, and. Your story came out, and it was just like, okay, that's another, that's another Ed Burns, it's another El Mariachi, it's another Clerks. I mean, there was just so many, Carnahan, yeah. Car- yeah, Carnahan, all those guys. Joe Carnahan, just like a year, a year and a half ago, it turned out we were like secret fans of each other. It was oh. like this embrace between two brothers oh, no. that have been through it in independent film, bad, you know. Oh my God! You know, just... If you had been there, it would have been great. <laughs> like it would have been perfect, a perfect circle jerk. But dude, yeah. I-, I swear to God. So I just had Joe on the show. And Joe and I have become buddies, man. Joe is, I absolutely, I understand that you two, just by the small amount of time I've spent with you, just the second I started talking to you, I'm like, oh yeah, you and Joe would get along famously. And Joe would love you. It's just like kindred spirits. I couldn't believe it. The night I met him, uh, we went to his screening of this, the new movie he was doing. It was about a year and a half ago with his best friend who was starring in it. It ended up being a really great one, but I hadn't met Joe yet. I'd just been like, when I saw Blood, Guts, Bullets, and Octane. Yeah, man, 98. It's yeah. like, who's this guy? <laughs> And then, you know, every time he got interviewed, he seemed like the, you know, the John Wayne of film, you know, just tough as nails. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like, like we're, we're, he sees me, he gets, you know, inundated by fans and stuff afterwards. Right. And uh, he sees me and he just he does one of these and he goes, Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden it's like, boom, and I'm getting squoze like I mean, he, this guy is he's really he, freaking strong. He's he's a, he's, yeah, a, he's a big dude. Little, exchange, even though I'm terrible with social media, we did the little exchangey, you know. Oh, it was so great meeting you last night. Yeah, uh, it, no, Joe's. <laughs> you guys would. Oh my God, it it would be amazing. It, yeah, you guys we would uh, do a movie together. Like maybe I produce some stuff that he directs and writes, and vice versa. Would that so be amazing? Independent film guys helping each other, especially <laughs> during this COVID crap. Jesus Christ, man. So um, so yeah, so. Uh, I wanted to bring you on the show, man, because there's been a lot of myth around your story. There's been a lot of, you know, things happening. There was obviously that documentary, which we'll talk about, and things that happened didn't happen. So I wanted to kind of really take it straight from the horse's mouth, from the right. from the guy who was in the center of the storm. What the hell happened? So take us back. <laughs> let's take us back to the bar, man, when you were when you're when you're bouncing and you wrote a script. How take us from there and take us down the journey, sir. Well, you know, it's, it, it, long and the short of it is, yeah, I've had uh, quite the wild ride, but uh, most of it has been extremely positive. I'm lucky to to have right. been able to do what I do, and I'm I'm uh, uh, very grateful that Boondock t- turned out the way it did. You know, mm-hmm. having faith in something like that, and then having it be confirmed by the public is mm-hmm. about. Like, I have a, the, the greatest fans in the world, and believe me, they're long suffering because I'm not so good at the social media thing. It's like it's grown up around me, and I'm like, ah. You know, at first, it started out with a guy like, you know, taking a picture of his croissant in the morning. It's, oh my God, a thousand people like your croissant. I'm like, what? The, I, just, I just didn't get it, right? But yeah, it, it, you know, I came to Hollywood. I came once upon a time. Yes, yeah. I came to Hollywood with a dream, and it was music at the time. When I first right. came out here, I wanted to be a rock musician, and my brother and I found some. Uh, one was our uh, friend from Colorado. We formed a band and uh, tried to make it happen. And then this all came up in the middle of it because what happened was I, I got I got so sick of seeing shitty movies that I said <laughs> I'm going to write one of these. And I, I, you know, I've had a bit of a history with writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father was a Harvard English Lit grad that made all of his kids read a novel a month. 
extracurricularly, wow. and we had to be ready to talk about it at at dinner on this particular, you know, what, wow. whatever Sunday we were done with the book, and we better have known our stuff. My dad was a, also an English teacher, and uh, so he made made it so that I knew what good writing was, great writing was, what shitty writing was, what okay writing was, and why the whys, the W's of all that. So I had a lot of experience, and I always had my head in a book, you know, mm-hmm. always, always do today, actually. So it wasn't the biggest leap in the world, you know. When it came out, like uh, it's this guy's first script, you know. Believe a bouncer, a bounce, a bouncer from a bar in L.A. Yeah. wrote a first yeah. screenplay and got picked up. That's the story, though. That was the narrative. It was the first script, and that really pissed every long-suffering writer in this town off. I remember this one time, dude, when the script was really gaining speed, and everybody was hearing about it, and I, I, maybe I had made the deal at this point. I'm not exactly sure, but I went to the local Starbucks, and uh, as I'm in line, it's it, to the back of this evidently writer's, frustrated writer's quorum, and they're mm-hmm. all reading my script. I had no idea how they got it, but I didn't say anything, so I got this momentary glimpse into what other writers thought and they just tore it apart thought it was shit and they, and they were really upset about that it was my first script and half of them didn't believe it like no 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 way it's someone it's impossible. Can, ghost ghost written, ghost written. <laughs> so i you know the, the the instant ire of every long-suffering writer in hollywood was uh w- happened like right away but yeah i just i got the thing done uh, i had a friend in contact at uh, uh new line uh cinema uh, CB was uh, a buddy of mine from before. He was now an assistant on a producer's desk over there. He read the thing, said, would you mind if I handle this? And I was like, go ahead. <laughs> I never thought it would even get read. I was just kind of doing it as a uh, kind of side thing. You but you, but, and by the way, when you were writing this screenplay, from what I understand, you like didn't even know what format was. Like, what did you, you like, did you longhand it and then transfer it? How would that go? I had a friend, you know, that w- worked in the, in the, in the movie business. You know, a uh, huge surprise being here <laughs> in, in LA. Los Angeles. But I was like, can you get me a script that's actually been made into a movie? And she got me the script of uh, it was a. Uh, it was a Robin Williams movie called Jack. Yeah. Yeah. It's Coppola's movie. I yeah. just read the format and copied it. I was scrawling things in notebooks while I was on the door at Sloan's. And uh, then I would rent a computer. I mean, this is the late 90s, you know, mm-hmm. 90. Five, I think, is when this was happening. Mid nineties. Uh, I would rent a computer every week and just transfer it over and copy the format from the from the Jack script. So I cobbled <laughs> together this thing that kind of looks like a script. So makes you know? makes screenwriters hate you even that much more. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even understand at the time there were writing programs. I don't even know if there was, but there was. You know, yeah, the final draft was around. The final draft yeah, was they around. Hate me. They hate me. <laughs> So, yeah, and then uh, it just took off from there. Evidently, you know, what I expected was for it to go into the, you know, big gray ocean of crap that, mm-hmm. uh, that, that Hollywood was famous for churning out. And what happened was the opposite. They read something that instantly had an effect on every reader. And so began this, you know, uh, uh, courtship by all the agencies trying to get me, you know, all the CAAs and William Morris's. I went with William Morris. Uh and, um, you know, the, the, the journey started right there. And that was like, it's funny because there's a dichotomy here. There's the journey started with, you know, Harvey Weinstein buys a guy a bar for his first, first time fledgling director. So, uh, you know, pulling a Troy Duffy in Hollywood became that type of thing, a success story. And then just a few years later, it became pulling a Troy Duffy was just going down in flames. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's what makes your story such a, an amazing kind of, you know, mythical stories because, you, dude, you <laughs> flew to the top. Like you dude, were... I had a Zoom meeting with a, a producer the other day that was like, <laughs> I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> For, for like a week just to, to, you know, see you and how you are, like all that shit that happened and what you did to Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> I was like, all right, well, I you, hope I lived up to the, but there's like a circus freak thing with me now. It's like, <laughs> you actually like that? Is it, what? 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 No, yeah, I'm sure people are going to ask me, like, did he eat his children when he was off the, off, <laughs> off air? I'm like, no. Is he living under a bridge now is talking it, to himself? Is it, 
yeah, this is a, this is a fake background that you've got going on. And, <laughs> and that, honestly, man, that's one of the reasons why I wanted you on the show too, man, because I wanted you to set the kind of record straight because there is so much BS out there about it and so many rumors and stories and and you know and obviously the doc which we'll get to in a minute and all of that kind of shit that just kind of built into this and then the whole mythology of boondock by itself yeah. like the yeah. movie itself and and all that so it, it so you were at the top of the top you i mean i don't think there was anyone faster to the top and i don't think there was anyone faster that flew back down the other way <laughs> So quickly. Oh my God, this is like way funner than I thought it was going to be. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. I'm so, actually looking forward to getting into some of this because so, after, you know, 25 years, I think I've finally figured out what happened. Exactly. All right. So <laughs> so you get so, – so William Morris has the script now. They're repping it out there. And there's – from my understanding, there's a bidding war, right? There became a bidding war okay. for it. Yeah. Between the two biggest indie houses out there. It was Mike DeLuca at um, New Line and Harvey Weinstein and Miramax. And it was that year that – um, Miramax swept the Oscars. I think they took 11 Oscars. So Wasn't the year of Chuck Lott and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like After the that, height. It was like at the height of, of... Harvey had found out that New Line wanted it and had, had it faxed to him on the, the private jet that he was on on his way to the Oscars. By the wow. time he landed and read every faxed page, he was like, get this kid, you know, in my hotel room. Uh, so which is I, not a which is not a good thing. <laughs> so, like, so I'm saying which is not a good thing normally. Yeah, it's not necessarily a good thing <laughs> these days, is it? But uh, yeah, I, and then that that bidding war started between the two uh, bigger biggest guys out there in, in the indie world, uh, Deluca and Weinstein. And then and then you told me a story uh, last time we spoke about Harvey when he wa- when you walked into the room when you first met Harvey yeah, within yeah. the first five minutes. I found this so fascinating. All right, yeah. And the first one, okay. Let's 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 re, let's let's rehash. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, Har- Harvey is uh, every uh, bit the the gangster that everyone thinks he is. I, I walked into the room, and you know, there he is. There's this nosh. It's like a buffet set up in this place. It's the Peninsula Hotel, and um, his brother Bob. I remember Harvey was just like getting fitted for a tux, and he sits down in this chair, and he's got his Got his knee up like this, and his big belly sticking out. And his brother's over his shoulder, almost like, like a bird on his shoulder. But Bob seemed to be the sort of brains of the outfit, and mm-hmm. B- Harvey was the 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 brawn, the muscle. So yeah. he's like uh, Harvey says, you know, who, you, w- what actors are you seeing in this for the roles? And he knew everything about the script, mm-hmm. right? So uh, I was like, well, you know, uh, the first guy I picked out was Jim Carrey. This is when Jim was in the process of doing uh, The Truman Show, his first dramatic picture. But I was uh, friends with his man. I'd become good friends with his manager, Jimmy Miller, at that mm-hmm. point, who is incidentally uh, Dennis Miller's brother. And they both have exactly the same vice. <laughs> it was just it was totally uncanny. But Jimmy was right. hanging out at the bar and stuff. And I loved Jimmy. And I was like, can we get uh it was a moment where he was trying to get it, but I was like, uh, so Jim Carrey for this one. Then I listed ac- actors for the other roles, and uh, he goes, uh, let me tell you something. If you don't go with Miramax with Boondock, you don't give Boondock Saints to Miramax and make a deal with me, I'm going to get every actor you just listed in my movies, and you won't get a single one. Wow. And I was just like, ding. No, well, there was like, there's two things that happen when you get gangstered that well that quickly. Yeah. Number one, you're pissed. You're like, I totally just walked into that. Uh, number two, you're like, I kind of want this guy on my side if I go make a movie. You know, <laughs> uh, these days probably not. Not so, much, not so much at the moment. And uh, everyone listening, I mean, he was the he was the 800 pound gorilla, literally and figuratively, um, oh, yeah. in in Hollywood at that time. So, I, I was telling you the other day, it was just like it's just kind of like you want a really cutthroat shark of a lawyer on your team and not against you. And that's kind of the, the same reaction you had. Yeah, uh, it was like, you know, and I think I said the other day when we were talking, yeah, you want a real shark lawyer, you just don't want to have to go out to dinner with him, you know? <laughs> uh, which was not exactly, I, I got a kick out of Harvey back in, in those days right. uh, uh, in a lot of ways. But, you know, that idea of you know, reaching down into the gutter and pulling up this kid, it was it was like pretty, pretty effective of me. And, all the stuff that was going on, all the ink that came from it, because I think it was during a conversation that happened slightly after that, because I didn't make the decision in the room, we're going with Miramax. Mm-hmm. Producers were right behind me going, 
don't do that. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. You know, tell him you'll give it a gift. He'll think about it. He came down to the bar a couple of days later. This big limo pulls up. Harvey and his whole entourage come out, and we all sit around having beers. And he was just like, "Hey, what are you going to do with the money?" Because he knew that I hadn't had you know any real money in my life. I said, "I'll probably buy this place. I love this bar." And he's like, "I'll buy it with you. We'll split it fifty-fifty." I said, "Deal. You got the fucking script. Let's go." Uh, wow. And it got all that. Oh, ink. So much ink. So that was like kind of the start of it. You know, I, I woke up uh, like a couple mornings later. That there I am on the cover of USA Today. An odd feeling, you know, you get a call yeah. from your dad like, what the hell are you doing out there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Have you been telling your parents about this at this point? Like you're like telling them what's going on? I'm not keeping them informed, but I, I didn't really, you know, uh, know myself. It was such a whirlwind. I'm sure I forgot a bunch of stuff in the town, you know, but – it was, uh, you know, my advice for anybody that this happened <laughs> for the three people this is going to happen to over the next 20 years. Uh, 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 best efforts to negotiate the purchase of in a contract means no efforts. That actually did not happen. We didn't buy the bar together and I didn't even buy it solo. But uh, you got a lot of ink, you know, and that was the, the beginning of, uh, oh, you want the Duffy deal type thing. Jesus Christ. Um, all right, so you're you're you you've got the deal with uh, you go with Harvey, and now you start going through casting, and now you're meeting everybody in town. You meet every, you're you're the bell of the ball, dude. Like everybody wants to know, everyone wants to be in. The, this is such an LA thing. Wants to be in the Troy Duffy business. Uh, <laughs> that was that was, uh, that, was what, that was happening at the time, and I think that I disappointed my handlers because all the people I wanted to meet. Mm -hmm. were, were my heroes of film and not necessarily gigantic movie stars, which I didn't right. turn down. But I was like, you know, I want to meet Patrick Swayze, bro. Oh, <laughs> man. I want to meet Jeff Goldblum. I want to meet, you know, and then, and then I, you know, uh, a bunch of others that, that had done the, the movies that I loved and cherished, you know, and I was thinking about it. I also didn't think that this was during the time where I don't know if you remember this. You have to remember this. You mm -hmm. were right there with me on this one. The, there was that time where big movie stars were coming down and doing small independent films to sort of reclaim their street cred. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. protect this movie from that. I just thought, like, no matter who the movie star is, they bring in that baggage. And I think I have a story here that's obviously effective and I want to tell it the right way. So I thought it needed either no names or up and comers or slightly recognizable people. Hey, that guy. I saw him. Well, we can take them to the next level. And, uh, you know, not the best way like in terms of the business and producers yeah. and agents you know if you're getting the movie star attention but you want to go this way that's not such a great thing and then the, the the next thing is he's difficult to work with right but, and, and off your first one too this was your first one if you already had a huge hit if you had reservoir dogs and you mm -hmm. want to do pulp fiction or you want to do jackie brown and you want to you want to cast robert forrester as yeah. a lead you could ha yeah. you had that street cred, but you were doing it right up front and that's where that was one mistake yeah, and possibly, you know, my my adjustment on that, because the, the, uh, Quentin used uh, notable guys that, that maybe not have been movie stars at the time, but, the, you know, all those guys in Reservoir Dogs, one of my favorite films, they were all, you know, established actors, yeah. period. Mm -hmm. I was actually looking for some pretty fresh faces. There was one point at which uh, I found this new young actor who loved this script and camped out on my doorstep, uh, Heath Ledger. And he... Wow. He loved it so much, and he was kind of coming off this kind of teeny bopper. Yeah. I forget the name of the movie. Ten, ten, uh, ten Things I Hate About You? Is that it? Is that yeah, it? that's the one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I loved him, and he was Australian, and he was like way tougher in his image than he was, but he's a deep, deep <laughs> artist. And uh, so, you know, I remember actually meeting with his agency and saying, Do you have anybody that looks like this? But they were, you know, dangling movie stars in a very, in, in, so they were kind of surprised, you know? This, young upstart kid over here is who you want when we're giving you this so that started the sort of uh he's he's difficult to work with and, and how old were you when this whole thing's going on dude? this is happening maybe 24 jesus 24. christ dude and, wow. if, and i was telling you the other day that i had a similar not nearly as publicized experience around 26 
where I almost made that movie for the mob and I wrote the whole book about it and all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> and, and I did this, I, dude, I almost did the same thing. I didn't have the press, I didn't have the ink, but I was talking to the big producers. I was meeting some of those actors you were talking to. I'm going to people's houses. I'm like flying out to LA and I'm going through all of this process. But the big difference was you had a gangster who actually could get things done on your corner. I had a gangster who was just threatening me on a daily basis. So. <laughs> I, know. I know. All right, to all your fans out there, Alex told me this story yesterday, and I was I was just gut laughing because it was like you you said something like uh, I was like going to set every day with Joe Pesci, and he's like, "Hey, kid, we like what we're saying. You're throwing a kitchen. You're all out saying creative and terrific." And then he'd have like a death threat before he went to. No, he's like, "How am I a clown to you? Am I funny? Why am I funny?" They, then you get that moment. So it's just. Absolutely brutal. Um, so you're 20. So you went over budget. You know, this is this is this is, this is foods and beverages here. This is a serious thing. I mean, you got to take it. <laughs> so you're 24 years old, which man, I don't know any 24 year old who can handle the kind of that kind of pressure, in general, like that kind of success so quickly. It's a difficult thing to handle when you're our age. Like it, yeah. it's it, it's to handle that kind of attention, that success, man. What did you think? I do. But, I, well, I, you know, you're so reluctant to even admit that because, you know, there's so many there's so many people out there that want to get into writing and directing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, oh, I don't know how I handle the success. You no, know, but it's, it's but, but I get that. It's, but it's a, you know, it's a real thing. It's, it is. It's, it's, it's like because it's like <laughs> anybody would want that. I, I totally wish I had the uh, the right. tools built into me to do the right things, you know, right. Like, right. I could give advice like what I do now. Mm -hmm. I would make that black book, keep in contact with every big producer agent. I keep the numbers, uh, make sure they knew what I was doing. Just call them up to chat every now and then because it, it is an incredibly social business. It is who you know. Mm -hmm. I did not know that at the time. I would also uh, recommend that you've got to set up your second project immediately. You can't just roll all the dice and put all your focus on this. You have to have a place to land no matter what happens here. Those types of things I wish I would have known. I was just kind of uh, free falling through it, you know. Yeah, and, uh, and I wish I had, had the, you know, I wish I had had the the wisdom. Maybe I, <laughs> if I had talked to you at the time. No, dude, I was, I, I, all I could tell you is this: when I was going through my version of Boondock Saints at a much smaller level um, of success um, or attention, for that matter, I was the only reason my head and my head was still so effing big man it was i was i was like i'm I'm being flown out i'm meeting these legends and icons and big producers and yeah. and all this kind of stuff my ego was pretty big the only thing that kept me in check was a giant mobster sitting behind me threatening my life that's the only yeah. reason i was not completely out of control because my ego was so ridiculously out of control at that age i just didn't know any better so it's it's not yeah. surprising so that's what you know, I was introduced to you, obviously, through the ink that happened when the whole thing went down. But then years later, this documentary shows up called yeah. o Overnight. And yeah. it, it doesn't I'm going to 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 say something, though. It doesn't paint. The, it doesn't paint the best picture. I'm just throwing it out there. This, <laughs> it's a slight it's a slight it's yeah. slightly it's slightly off. So, you know, you watch you watch that. And when you when I first watched it, I, I you know I'll be honest with you, like anybody who watches, it is like, oh, this guy's a fucking maniac. This guy's crazy. He threw his whole life away. All this stuff. But in when I got older, man, I look back and I go, you know what, man? First of all, editing. Secondly, <laughs> first thing, editing. Editing yeah. can be a bitch, um, and I can I can cut anybody to look like anything. I mean, even if you give them the meat, you can make it look much worse than it really was. That's one. Yeah. Two. I put myself in your place and I go, you know what, man, if I was 24, 25 and I had that go through me, I'm not sure I would be much better, uh, to be honest. So I, I had compassion and empathy for what you were going through. So overnight shows up, you know, tell me what what your experience was with that when it showed up, how it happened, all that kind of stuff. All right. How it happened is probably uh, um, the, the place to start there. How it happened. First, like sort of blanket statement. This was totally my fault. 100 percent i mean right. crow eat yes i should never have even let it happen yeah. never mind you know with my friends and stuff all, all i mean i had a i had an entourage around me mm -hmm. and uh 
you know, that had had, that was these the guys in the band and a couple of really close friends. We were all at the bar. It was like a social thing. I mean, when I met Mark Wahlberg, it was it was really funny because he had an entourage too. You know, and our entourage was like mirror images of each other. It's like the, the two Western guys coming across, you know, eyeing each other. But we, we really liked each other, and I should have learned more from him. He was really good at dealing with his with his aunt, with his guys, and I just kind of wasn't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, those guys that uh, did the actual documentary were a guy named Mark Bryan Smith, another guy named Tony Montana, a.k.a. Tony the Pants which is the uh, <laughs> moniker we gave him. Um, they were friends. They were bros hanging out. They were part of the, the gang. And, uh, you know, one of them came up with this idea, pitched it to me, like, you're going through all this stuff now. We start a documentary now. You, you, the idea was music and film. Go through right. the making of the album, the making of the, the film, and uh, it can become like an educational documentary for kids at film school, which it did. It was it's <laughs> reasons. <laughs> Congratulations, guys! You really pulled that one off. Um, and the uh, so they they got uh, they got together on it. And uh, Mark had uh, just uh, um, uh, graduated New York Film School, and Tony wanted to be a producer. So they kind of seemed like a, a perfect match. And uh, they were doing they started doing it. But I mean, if I if I really had the analogy to to to, to describe what actually happened, mm -hmm. it's when you invite like six of your buddies over your house to help you build a front porch within 10 minutes everybody's arguing about what kind of uh what kind of screws to use if the foundation's okay no we got to demo the old one out all the way we got a day everybody are you get it done at the end of the day but there's strife and at the end you feel mm -hmm. like maybe i should have hired a subcontractor for this <laughs> You know, <laughs> Maybe I should have got my hands dirty on this one. <laughs> yeah, but ba basically, you no. Know, it sort of started out well. These guys were like really highly motivated, and they were bros, you know. So we, yeah, I'd, when I would come out of the, the of wherever I was, and Mark would come out of the bushes, literally with a camera. I'm like, wow, that's some dedication, <laughs> right? But I didn't. I took my eye off the ball. I, it, what happened was that you know antagonism between all of us. And uh, the documentarians uh, started feeling slighted in a lot of ways. And I uh, can't say they didn't have a point a bunch of times, but I, I, I was that naive kid that was like, it'll all work out in the wash. We're all bros. Everything will be fine. Just do your documentary. And it was supposed to be, you know, not, not what it ended up being. It was supposed to be like this story. And, you know, the, I think the, the number one thing I, those guys would say was like, hey, don't worry. We're your friends. We'd never fuck you. Because they were getting like, you know, some pretty saucy footage on all. I can't tell you how many times, you know, after a drunken night, one of the guys called me up. All right. You know, band meeting. Get those guys over here. <laughs> and, uh, erase the tapes. Erase the tapes. <laughs> erase the tapes. Crank call. Crank call. Click. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, it's it started that way with just these little seeds of discontent. And, you know, by the time we were done going through the whole rigmarole of the movie and the album, it all happened. It was like the most... It was the most, uh, the hardest year, two years of my life, getting all that done right. and all the ups and downs in it. And then they get their footage and they just like disappear. And, you know, the first thing we all felt was relief. We were like, God, all right, we don't have to have these arguments anymore. Do we thought they were just taking a break and went, can't, would come back. But, you know, a year later, this thing comes out. And uh, wait, wait, did, they, did they not tell you anything that was going on? They just started cutting this thing and they just said, because you signed what you signed the release, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So they just cut it and released it without letting you know at all anything. Correct. Oh, son of a <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. Yeah. Well, that's I like, mean, that's bad. Not only is it bad form, but I mean, I, at least I would, if you're going to, and I don't even, how old were they, man? Who care? I mean, they were kids too. Dude, they were all like, kids, man. I mean, we're all. The real tragedy there is that they they had it. They had the film they told me they were going to make. They they had 400 hours, I think, mm -hmm. of real depth, you know, straight immediately when things happen behind the scenes. They had a, a, a deeper behind the scenes than I could ever imagine. Me and the guys gave them all the access in the world. Even when we were doing movies and, and albums, we told everybody around, we'd, we'd hold them up. These guys are doing it. Please help them. So – the they have the day-to-day -day true story of what really happened there uh and and the the in my opinion triumphant 
story that it is. Boondock Saints ended up doing something and being something mm-hmm. to a lot of people, meaning a lot of to a lot of people. And it came out of all that turmoil. And that documentary, I mean, can you imagine mm-hmm. what the if the fans could get a hold of something like that? That uh, you know was it wasn't um, a smeary thing, but like this is what happened. This is how we 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 actually got there. I can't tell you how many people have done two things that really kind of it, if I find it jarring. Like a, a guy will go, "Hey, I saw your documentary last night," and I'm like, "Whoa, that is not my documentary." Why would I direct or release this? <laughs> <laughs> like who the hell would do that to themselves? Uh, and uh, the other, the the other, the other one uh, I find uh, jarring is that people kind of um, there's 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 two there's two things about it. Like the, you, what you just said was kind of uh, prophetic. When you're young and in film school and you watch it, you're just like tale of tragedy. This guy's a maniac. Dismissal. I learned something from this. Don't be a dick. Right. Uh, it's, it's exactly it. it's exactly what I said. Watch it when you're your age and you go editing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, there's a lot of so there's there is a even though 100 percent my fault should never let it happen. Right. Sure, if I was, I should have deigned to control it better. Um, uh, but uh, the, yes, there is that aspect to it. There is an aspect to it where the, the, it, it, there was some very. Uh, Loosely edited scenes to make points that didn't really happen that way. Right. And, and and the thing that's sad about it is I think you're right. If they have 400 hours of footage of this entire experience of from, from the beginning up to the beginning and the end, you know what? Part of that journey is probably a little messy, probably okay. a little egocentric. We lost our heads a little bit. Hey, man, any of us would. But it would have been actually a really more in just a better documentary if you would have gone back at the redemption phase where like you know what i've learned something and i'm gonna fight and i'm gonna keep going and i'm gonna get boondocks done and it yeah, gets that's done one of, that's one of the things that you know was kind of a necessity to me because we we never had a, me and the guys that all signed off on this to to the filmmakers who were, were just frankly our friends you know mm-hmm. the, we the 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 whole thing was you know we we didn't hold back we gave them you know, part of the rub was we were giving them some pretty saucy footage. We mm-hmm. were letting them open their cameras up wide on some things that most people wouldn't, mm-hmm. you know, that could risk making me or all of us look bad. And we started getting concerned in that way. And uh, the the shame of it is that they have they had um, they they had uh, they had people that were willing to do that. Give them the real story. All you got to right. do is this a little bit right. and tell the real story. Right. Don't embarrass people un- unnecessarily. Don't attack them. Don't just tell the damn story in in the, the what people people are. By the way, they're interested in the in the sensational for about two seconds. Right. And then it's what depth? What is this saying? What is this teaching me? And that story, I think, is probably still out there somewhere in four hundred hours of footage in a dark, uh, you know film film storage place and it's a, it's a shame have you because and have you ever have you ever heard, talked to them again after that or no the day they walked out of my life uh-huh. and went to this thing i have heard no hide nor hair have seen them talk to them nothing wow for like that's took 20 years now something like that something like been since since then that happened jesus yeah. christ man and that's I because I, I when again when I saw this, I was like, one day I would love to talk to Troy and find out what the hell happened behind the scenes because nobody in their god in, in their in their sane mind would allow this to happen. <laughs> like you just said. Like you just said. Uh, yeah, I wasn't as as hard as it is to believe after watching that. Uh, I, I, I I was sane. Mm-hmm. That happened in a very, you know, the the normal way. Rubs between uh antagonism. <laughs> Oh, uh, between between people that are all trying to go towards the same goal, it, it just happens. And, you know, it, it, you get kind of sometimes I'm ashamed of it. Sometimes I'm sorry about it. Sometimes I can feel a guy in a room, you know, is looking at some producer over here is looking at me because they always come up afterwards and they're like, well, wh- what happened there? What happened? You know, and, and so it's something that haunts me and hangs over me. I won't yeah, deny right, that. Right, right. But, I, you know, I know what happened there. It's funny, too, because I didn't watch it for a couple of years. But right when it came out, I didn't watch it. Right. And it was on advice from Billy Conley. He was like, you know, don't watch it, boy, my dear boy. And we can just say you haven't seen it. Fuck him. So I didn't. Right. Uh, then it came about, you know, it, it, it kind of screwed me in a business deal over here in the in the uh, on, a, on a project. So I watched it 
And there is nothing more boring than watching yourself for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, oh, but then I saw kind of what they did. I was there. I know what really happened. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of saw how it was, uh, you know, I'm sure creatively edited together mm -hmm. to service, you know, some some things that weren't. It, 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 it gave false impressions here and there. But, yes, I did all that stuff. I, I, I yelled all to, at all those people. Mm -hmm. I mistreated people. Uh, but, the, you know, the question you have to ask yourself is, can somebody actually do that? And, and actually, why is everybody throwing money in deals at this kid if he's acting like this 24 seven? Those right. were the exceptions. Those moments were the exceptions. <clears throat> I always smoothed things out. Uh, deepened my relationships, and I was able to get this done on my terms, my very first one, you know, and that's the story, really. And, uh, yeah, they're never going to see that, I guess. So, I mean, that would be amazing if one day, you know, these guys, maybe they'll watch this and they'll go, look, man, uh, let's try to do a real version of this. I don't know. I doubt that that'll ever happen. That's a magical world thinking. But, yeah, no. <laughs> but like, you know, would, wouldn't that be amazing if you're like, look, dude, I'll give you the 400 hours, Troy. You do whatever you want with it and cut your own documentary. That you know would be what? amazing. I, I got to be honest with you. The, then then you, go, you go to the other side. We're back to editing. Mm -hmm. I, I can't edit together truthfully my own story. No, you I'm have like, to hire somebody. You yeah. think that makes me look bad? I, mean, I'll, I, I just like hire you. I'll, I'll be like, Alex, you got to fucking do this for me. You'd be like, 400 hours of footage? I got my own shit going, bro. I'm not <laughs> doing this. And I'll be like, I need somebody that's not me that I trust to do this. Please, yes. bro. Yeah. Let's go. Let's, well, you, me, and Joe will get together. Uh, well, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll you so hard, dude. So, well, I'll sit together. We'll get an editor to come together. We'll <laughs> we'll put all the footage together and put out the true story of the making of Boondock Saints. Um, finally, finally, after twenty five years. All right, so good. I'm glad that we, that's out of the way, and, and we kind of talked about overnight because I'm sure that's one of your favorite topics to always talk about. Um, <laughs> It's great. It's, my, it's <laughs> wonderful. It was, it's, what was really bad was like during the, the sequel, when we came out with the sequel, of, when we came out Boondock 2, it, that had already been an old story for like seven, eight years. It had come right. out, I think, 2002, 2003. We're coming out in 2009-ish. And um, almost every reporter, it was like they just Googled, okay, what's, who's this a-hole? Oh, and they asked me questions about it. And Norman Sean would have to, they, they were put in the position of, of having to defend uh, their friend and director. And I, uh, I, I, I was super pissed off about that. Yeah, of course. A little embarrassed. But, you know, it also shows you when you got friends, when you have friends in this business, because even now today, you know, yeah. there are these pockets of producers at big companies and, and, and uh, people in the business that are, are pretty big fans of mine, regardless of all that. Yes, there are those that have bought in like, oh, that guy, no, no way. Mm -hmm. but I have my fans, you know, all, all in. It's been a really positive thing. And I'm sort of glad. I mean, you learn from your mistakes more, don't mm. you? I mean, it, it, Preach. I learned such a, so many lessons about all that, especially in having to think about it and being confronted with it and having it haunt me over the years in this business and cost me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I got to sit back and go, what was the mistake I made in the pinch of that moment? What should I have done? I was feeling this way. Why? I need to be feeling this way and move forward. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, I learned a hell of a lot. I really wouldn't change a thing. You know, at the end of the day, I have had the wildest ride. And yeah, maybe I have that reputation of, uh, you know, the the. Uh, the the shining new talent that was in and then bam, you know, he's a maniac. But I think I've gotten a hell of an education in this business <laughs> of all that, you know, and, th and then some and then some. So so the um, and, and look, man, again, any of us put in that situation at that age. Look, I, look, and this this is pre social media, bro. Can you imagine if there was Facebook and Twitter during oh, that time? You would have been it would have been dead. I don't want anything that I was doing at that age out. I was I was yeah. probably I was probably a dick. You know, I know there was relationships that were you know destroyed oh, because yeah. of, of of working on projects together and egos got involved and never spoke to them again. This happens. This is the business we're in. It is an ego driven a lot of times, ego driven, especially when you're young. Especially yeah. when you're coming up, the ego yeah. is so powerful and so big. And I've talked to some really big guys in the business, and I realize the bigger they are, the egos seem to be more controlled, more they're more comfortable in their own skin. It's the new guys or the people who don't have experience in the in the battlefield that has 
that because like just talking to you here, man, you're much calmer <laughs> than you were when you were 25. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a fun little secret. Almost all of my friends got so pissed. The people that were there with me and the people yeah. that loved me, my yeah. real friends, both in the business and just, you know, regular life. Sure. Um, they, there have been times of, with all of them. This moment has occurred, you know. We got to speak out against this goddamn documentary. <laughs> you know, it's like if people really got to know you and who you were, they wouldn't be, they'd be saying it's a b- big pile of shit. Yeah. You know, and that's happened so many times. And I've had to kind of talk them back from the ledge. You know, like this is, I did this. This is my fault. It's, as bad as what you may think of, of what, what happened. And it, as unfair as it is, I did this. You know, and it was the the first real punch of ego control came when I understood that, that yeah. we're in control of our own things, that we're the ones that are responsible. Uh, those two guys completely forgiven and understood. It was me. It was me. They 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 lashed out and did something to to hurt me because I had hurt them. And that's pretty much all there is to it. And, you know, the and I don't think the, the, the one of the worst tragedies about it is they didn't get anything from it really no but well right now i mean i i don't know any projects that these guys are on i'm selling like right. search around i i got Rocco called me up the other day and said one of them had just kind of totally left the business and retired from it uh, mm-hmm. i was a couple years ago too so they didn't really get the uh, uh i don't know how they made out with money but i i know that it didn't make much money well, no, it's it's like a niche of like it's a niche of a niche of a niche of a documentary, basically yeah. focused on filmmakers, and yeah. that's not going to be a, you know a hundred million dollar doc. <laughs> so they didn't. I don't think that they benefited or or had much success in in terms of their of their lives and careers from it. And I certainly didn't benefit from it, you know, <laughs> except in a, a sort of an inner way of. <laughs> You, I, I would argue, I argue you got the most out of it, sir, because in, in your inner peace, sir. Uh, that's the important thing. You're right. Oh I mean, God. the growth that that has taught as he swigs back a, a bottle. No, uh, <laughs> no, like, no, the inner, look, the, look, in, no bullshit aside, dude, seriously, you have gotten to, uh, to um, evaluate what you did wrong. I look, I wish I would have had not publicly, but a documentary that would go back and show me all the idiot things I did. Like that whole thing with the gangster, dude, my DP was telling me, you should be filming this because this is more entertaining and more educational than any movie we will ever make. He told me this while we were there. Why did we film none of it? I wish we would have seen like what was going on. I wish we would have filmed. It would have been the most amazing documentary ever yeah. about how to make them how not to make a movie that was the story right that there. was the story but look man but you have you had re- self-realization and that is huge look, worth its weight and gold that's the important thing now you know i i the, the i don't think that there's many situations that could arise in terms of me moving forward with my career and doing other films that are right. gonna really uh, that i can't id and see coming from about a thousand miles away you know it's not like i'm you know, Mr. Super Careful, hide under a rock. Um, no, no, I'll, but I'll still be myself. But uh, <laughs> I, I have, I have definitely learned, and I give it its due course and consideration right, right. now. You know, well, and being a director is a very rare uh, position to be in, and it's, it's, it, you're, you're very uh, blessed mm-hmm. if you get to direct a film. I've been able to direct two. I'm very blessed, and. Um, you know, n- knowing more and more about the business and moving forward, uh, I'm going to you get stronger and stronger with this stuff. And it is the mistakes. It is the times you get kicked in the nuts. If you're paying attention, that uh, is the reason that you do It is the reason that you get better with this. It is the reason you learn lessons and are able to move forward. And and look, man, you've got shrapnel, lots of it. I've got shrapnel, lots of it. And that's why. <laughs> Airport. I got set off airport <laughs> all the time because, <laughs> but that's what makes us who we are. And I'm glad, look, I, I, I don't know if you've ever had this opportunity before. I'm sure you've been interviewed about this a million times, but I hope this is going to get out there in a big way to really kind of set the record straight because I wanted to give you a platform to just go, this is what really effing happened, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess you got the exclusive. Alex Ferrari. <laughs> I haven't really ever talked in depth uh, like this about that. Right, well, that's I'm, I'm humbled about that, and I hope this I hope this is a teaching tool 
not only for you and me, sir, because I'm learning a lot from this as well, um, but for everyone listening, because look, I, I, I started Indie Film Hustle purely because of my experience in the business and all this crap that I did. My origin story, I was told when I wrote the book, I'm like, you guys want to know why I have this grizzled, like hard voice behind this mic all the time telling you guys that, that you're going to get punched in the face in this yeah. business. I don't care who you are. It was because of that experience. And I'm trying every day to help filmmakers avoid those things. And I hope this interview and this conversation goes a long way by doing that. So I do appreciate you doing that, brother. Uh, I, I appreciate the the the, the uh, platform to air it out a little bit. You know, I, I have not been, uh, I must have the most faithful fans in the world because I have not been good with social media or talking about any of this stuff. So it's good to kind of get it out there. And I'm going to, I'm going to be going on my own stuff. And right now I'm, I'm about to make the biggest mistake of my career. You ready? You ready yes, for another? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bear myself anew. Uh, now it's not just, yay, he's the ideal deal. And uh, oh, boom, he goes down. <laughs> it's now the new one. I am going to start getting into social media. Uh, and I don't God know. Help, any God help us all. God help us all, sir. God help us all. <laughs> My fans are like, listen, if you don't want to know what's going on, ask Troy. And, uh, and I, this whole thing is kind of the social media thing has kind of happened. And I've I've been checked out on it. So I'm going to start doing that. And half the reason is because, you know, COVID. This sucks. I got nothing to do, man. We were talking about that the other day, too. Yeah. And I'm, I, I've known, for, like, dreaded it for years. I've known I had to do this. And all those fans, you know, they do, They deserve a world of credit for kind of sticking with me and loving Boondock the way they do. I, I don't know that there's many right. uh, films with that kind of shelf life, man, and that well, kind of effect. No, I'll, I will tell you off air, you and I can sit down and talk. I can guide you a little bit on social media. I've been doing it for a little while as well, so I can help you along Good those. I, need, I, I, need. Will, I will help you, sir. I will, I will help you a little bit. Now, so now that that all's out of the way, now let's talk about the redemption, the, the, the coming back up. So you, you get boondocks back from, from, um, the man who shall not be named, um, Voldemort. Let's call him Voldemort. Uh, <laughs> Valdestein. <laughs> Valdestein. Valdestein. Um, so you get your, your script back eventually, and then you, you get it released. So tell the story of how it actually gets made. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're hitting on some secrets that I've kept for 25 years, dude. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, exclusive it shit. I shouldn't say number two. <laughs> <laughs> got the documentary out of me and now you're gonna get some weird uh, yeah. <laughs> the the <laughs> all right i'm not gonna give you all of it but i'll give you a couple of as much as dude as much or as little as you want brother when we came to blows I mean, me and harvey just disagreed on things and he's like all right that's it uh you're in turnaround now you know what it is um but uh for the for the, for the viewers out there that don't that means that if, if harvey has say bought your script three hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, done a uh, uh, paid a couple of your producers and uh, done maybe one location scout say he's in it a million bucks what turnaround is is that you put it like a yard sale you put it back out uh, for sale you know this script that was highly uh, desirable by the in industry uh, and you try to recoup some of your money uh, about the most anyone gets in a uh, turnaround situation is 50 percent half their investment uh, so Harvey puts it in turnaround. Lo and behold, this other company wants to do it, a new, a new company, a new guy. And uh, he charges 100% in a turnaround situation. Uh, I was friends at the time uh, with a guy named Arnold Rifkin, who was the president of William Morris and a friend. I had to tell you about going up to his house one day. It was unbelievable. Too. <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> about a young man's ego sore and i was like this guy had guard dogs that responded to german it was amazing <laughs> it was like true lies it was like the beginning it was like the opening of true lies got it <laughs> right so he was like you know i really looked up to arnold and um he gets super pissed you know like harvey weinstein will not be treating our clients like this so he puts red his whole company on red alert boondock saints gets made right now find somebody to pay the hundred percent or we chop harvey down in some way but this movie gets made and this young Writer director gets out there. Wow! Because when you're put in turnaround, by the way, that's death. You're you're somebody's. You and I am now the black sheep of Miramax. No one wants to touch me. Uh, you know, certain things are already known about me in the industry. The sort of uh, yay Troy thing is going downhill at this point, and this couldn't have happened at a worse time. It's the first real tragedy that uh, I absorbed in the business, right? So. 
uh, on comes one of my favorite human beings in the world, Cassian Elwes, who was uh, the president mm -hmm. of independent film financing over there at mm -hmm. William Moore. Uh, he's actually <laughs> Harry Elwes' right. uh, brother mm -hmm. from Men in Tights. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> well, Princess, I mean, Princess Bride saw, but but you yeah. you chose Men in Tights. That's fine. <laughs> say about you i mean carrie carrie's done i mean i mean uh, he's done a, a couple things i'm just saying no, no, yeah yeah so uh cassian was a, he's about the greatest guy in the world mm -hmm. so so he finds you know this the company will come in they're they're going to pay the hundred percent a turnaround situation wow. and uh it's the first time rifkin said you know i'm all my years in this business i've never seen this happen and clearly harvey does not want this movie being made for obvious reasons mm -hmm. you know he doesn't want it becoming successful when you know, he's writing, writing you off as a mistake and trying to make everyone forget that this even happened. Mm -hmm. uh, cut to get the thing made. I get a bottle of champagne a note from Harvey on the day, first day of principal, which I completely mistake as uh, genuine. Uh, <laughs> but it was just a gangster tactic. It was <laughs> to screw you up, to screw you up on your day one. Yeah, that's all it was. Yeah, it was like the gangster walking you to say, hey, you're doing a good job. We're liking what we're saying. We're like, yeah. <laughs> Here's a fish. <laughs> uh, here's a fish newspaper. Don't read into it. Don't read into it. <laughs> so I get the, you know, get the movie made, and yeah, you know, we're going to spare you some of the other stories, but uh, there was, there was, there was some quite obvious things that happened once I tried to get my little movie out there, mm -hmm. where roadblocks were, you know, inexplicably being thrown up in front of this film, and I had people from this industry calling me telling me that they had been straight up intimidated either by him personally or people wow. representatives for his, from his company, wow. you know? And so it was this campaign to so. then when the movie got made to end it, to end it and have no one see it. But strangely enough though, and here's the fucked up part of this. Mm -hmm. He didn't have, he wasn't able to study. When you, you make a movie like that, that the kids are going to find it's, it's going to happen no mm -hmm. matter what. The thing that really screwed us at the time was a whole nother deal. It was caught with two weeks before we were kind of, we were having our screenings for the industry. And that's where you take your little movie. You go to the big lot, Sony, Paramount, and sure. Fox. You, it, we went to all of them. And you have screenings for all them and their buyers and all buyers from all, all over the place. And so you got packed. I was, we were having packed screenings, three, four hundred people. Uh, almost no one was leaving, which always happens mm -hmm. in these types of screens. But you're basically asking somebody, you know, buy my film and distribute it through your your engine, your network. And uh, Columbine happened. And uh, I don't I don't know if you remember right uh, the fuck there like it was on cue. Uh, We're having screenings that are off the charts. And people are loving it. And then nobody coming forward. We were reading the kind of writing in the sand. Finally, this one, this one buyer comes up to us and says, "You know, congratulations." He's highly complimented. Congratulations, you made a great movie, and he very, very uh, nice about it. He said, you, "You've been you've been blacklisted from U.S. screens. Nobody is going to theatrically release this movie, so you got to uh -huh. put it on video." And that was just like dun dun dun. You know, we were all. Talk about trying to find your answer in the bottom of a beer glass. We just, everybody, like, well, hard, how hard we'd worked and this thing that happened, nothing to do with us. But all the all the touchstones in it, people in trench coats did this. I, I, two oh, guys, oh, sort of, oh, uh, it, was, no. it was two, it was two young men. Well, uh, they did the violence. I had two young men, you know, mm. it, and it was just all the parallels were ridiculous. And it was exactly what they were stopping production on and pulling out of theaters right there. At the Clinton landed here and had a whole talk with the industry and they, they reacted that way. You just stop production on anything with violence in it right now, especially the youth, youthful violence, pull anything with violence out of theaters. They even started in with video games. And I was right there with my little film going, please help me. You know? And we just got screwed. But, fun story, Boondock was about to touch the public for the first time, mm -hmm. right? And I was in the darkest depression ever because I'm like, it doesn't matter now. There, 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 no theatrical release. There's no way this film's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I meet this guy, Dean Wilson, who remained one of my dearest friends and contacts in this business until his death uh, a couple years ago. 
Dean was the CFO of Blockbuster. And they had 7,500 stores. They, that was the, during the biggest. They, they were huge. Mm -hmm. they, they were home video for every studio. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of power. So I take him down. It was like, actually, it was me and Flannery. <laughs> you know? And a couple, of, I think maybe even Norm was there. We take him down to Photochem and arrange a screening for him to see the film. I remember, because I'd already seen it a million times. I fell asleep in the only thing that I had bought with my newfound riches, which was the 68 Chevelle fire engine red with tinted windows, badass car. <laughs> I get a knock on the window and I, here's this excited guy, Dean Wilson. Right. And uh, he's like, oh, my God, that's great. He goes, we're going to we're going to release this and make a deal uh, for you to have, be a blockbuster exclusive. I didn't know what that was at the time, but what wow. they were doing. What they were doing was taking smaller films that they felt should have been theatrical released or that they saw some thought would really touch their their public uh, and release them in, in blockbuster stores like they were big films. Instead of two copies per store, there was 60 or 120, depending on the size of the store. So Boondock was released on video as if it was some big theatrical success. And I remember walking through the local my local blockbuster store and just seeing shelves and shelves of Boondock Saints, you know, at that time, um, videotapes. It was VHS at first, mm -hmm. you know, and this was right during the, the crossover of DVD was beginning. So I was like, all right, make the deal. So they made the deal, right? And uh, come to find out later on that it was Blockbuster's highest grossing straight to video hit in their history. Now, something I always kidded Dean about was. He had the blockbuster had the or he had the opportunity to buy the home video rights for one hundred and fifty grand slightly after he saw how well it was doing. It made some ridiculous amount in six months, like mm -hmm. like twelve million bucks. You mean as a as a part as part of the deal? And it's like it was an, it was a we're, we're going to take a, a the deal was we're going to do an exclusive blockbuster video window. We'll pay you this much and share this much of the profits with you. And they were like, all right. You want the, uh, vi the all the video rights too, so you can sell all VH not just rental deal, but like you can sell uh, all, right. all the VHS and DVDs that are going to come out because of this for 150 grand. If he had taken that deal, I remember just lighting into him once when we were at dinner. <laughs> he took me to dinner to meet Charlie Icon. It was <laughs> the best. It was the best. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, you guys, you guys had the opportunity to buy that for 150 grand and in front of Charlie Icon. I went. You would have made a hundred and fifty million dollars if you had done that. And the, by the way, by that time, the numbers were in. So that wow. wasn't a joke. And Dean was like, thanks. <laughs> I think you meet Charlie Icon. He's the most embarrassing goddamn thing. I've ever done. It's, like, it's kind of like, like it's nobody, like when it's nobody, when like, like, nobody would have seen it if it wasn't for this guy. So I like right. owed him everything. Right. It's kind of like when Fox uh, gave Lucas the uh, sequel rights and the merchandising rights for Star Wars. Yeah, so, I can't tell you how many times people have compared <laughs> me to George Lucas there, but let me show you how not. Uh, <laughs> that's the George Lucas was smart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I'm just angry. At one point, I went, I want the merchandising rights. And they were like, you're making a $6 million film. Who do you think is going to buy a t shirt? Right. So it was the easiest thing in the world to shut me up, to give me the merchandising rights. And that ended up being saving my bacon in a lot of ways. Yeah. So so the movie comes out. It's a huge success. Um, everybody sees it because it's – and for people who don't understand Blockbuster in 2001, 2002, 2003 in that world, they were at the height of their of – their, It was 2000. It was released 2000. in 2000, the Blockbuster. And you're right. It became a huge hit. Huge. And apparent, apparently no one noticed except the people of Blockbuster and the fans. When a, a movie does that kind of business, you know, just think about a company owing on 10 other movies that maybe did not do, mm -hmm. didn't even recoup. There's all kinds of problems that can happen. And we uh, got into this area where, you know, from, from the industry, what we were being told was it's not a success. You know, nothing. You got nothing. We got a, yeah, I got a contract says I'm owed money here. So. No. Nope. It didn't do well. And I, I remember going to a gas station one day and seeing my first kid with the fucking tattoos for my movie. Wow. on. And I just, you know, I'm looking, I didn't say anything to him. And I start noticing in public, you know, I'm at bars and suddenly 
people will pop off lines from my movies while they're screwing around with each other at a pool table. So it was hard for me to believe that it wasn't doing well when I was seeing it in my own life just randomly, you know? So we ended up, you cut two years later, had a big lawsuit, settled that all out, got right. the secret rights and went forward with that, which we, we may have to, we may have to piece this into two interviews, bro. <laughs> Too much out of me, but yeah, it became extremely successful. But, and but so in other words, Hollywood accounting took over is what you're saying. In a lot of ways. I mean, there's a lot I can't say because it's a Fair enough. Door. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, you know, the, the old adage of, uh, you must have heard it too, you know. You, you, you get fucked on your first one. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Make, you, you're never gonna make money on your first one. That's yeah, your, it's just, yeah, just it's when you, yeah. It's the sequel. That's where the money uh, yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, yeah, that happened too. Was, yeah. And then, and to and to and to be fair, George as well on the first one financially didn't do well on the movie. The, the merchandise he did okay, but the yeah. um the movie didn't do well. But Empire, he that's where he started really yeah. making. No. his money so same thing so no. you're so you go through this process the movie gets out you get the rights back and now you own and control the sequel rights to boondock right at this point well you got the rights back at least yeah 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 yeah. we we uh, got the right because you know the, the the sequel rights were wrapped into this company and this lawsuit we were in so once it, that was settled we got our sequel rights and we were able to do uh two and within 48 hours of the conclusion of that, uh, of those legal troubles, we had a deal for two on the table with Sony. And and then and then that went. I remember reading, because I kept I kept I followed you over the years. I was like, what happened to Bo- what happened to Troy? What happened to Boot? So I'd always like read whatever was out and some some things. So when the sequel came out, I was reading like how did he do? What's going on? And from what I understood, and please correct me if I'm wrong, this, the merchandising rights, that that's it's like George says. The money's in the launch box is idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, did well. Uh-huh. Uh, and it still is, you know, but uh, the, it's, the, you know, with, with, the, with the sequel, yeah, that, that's made a metric ton of money and done very, very well and continues to. You know, cult, a cult, cult classic is about the coolest two words in film. And, uh, you know, I wasn't the first to say that. There was a whole bunch of other people that did. And that's what I'm. That's what I've done, and I'm extremely grateful to all those long-suffering fans. Because I mean, if you think about it, they're they're going to be waiting ten years between one and two, and another ten between two and three. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sucks, but you know, it's, it's you're like the Kubrick of of indie of indie films. Like he does one movie every ten years. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm like Lucas and Kubrick, just not half as talented or wealthy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just like them, but completely different. <laughs> so um, I have to ask you, though. So the sequel comes out. You, did, you do very well with that. You're, you're doing well with merchandising. Um, what is the biggest lesson you learned, man, in this entire boondock journey? Like, what was that thing that you just like, fuck? <laughs> you know... I think it's what I said before, that this business is all about relationships. I may have been able to sustain some of the more controversial things that happened Mm -hmm. if I had maintained my relationships properly, Mm -hmm. you know, with agents, with producers and with actors. Uh, And also um, learning from your mistakes and right there, right after you make them. Don't take 20 years to figure something out like I did. Learn right, you have to walk out of a room, say, screwed up, how did I do it? What did I do? Why? Don't do it again, here's the right thing to do. So learning from your mistakes and keeping that black book going would be the two essential pieces of advice, but really, if you boil that down, it's just growing up and maturing. A level of maturity and uh, w- a director just needs to be, and this is the part that I didn't need to learn and didn't make many mistakes. A, di- a director needs to be somebody that people trust on set. This guy knows what he's doing and that they'll, they will follow you to the ends of the earth. They will go into meal penalties. They won't call their unions and bitch about things. You know, they'll, they will follow you and really, really give you 110%. And when you're doing a movie that you truly believe in, that is the most important thing, having that cast and crew. 
go, no, to surround you and protect you and do, you know, uh, uh, execute perfectly. And with big, fat, beautiful hearts and put them, they're all into it. That is the part that I had down. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think in a lot of ways, Boondock went so well. You know, Boondock was it turned out the way it was. This this film with a shelf life of fucking uranium. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. You should be a writer. You should be a writer, sir. <laughs> even today, even today, like when I'm almost forced to see like people, what do you do? Oh, I'm a filmmaker. Well, I film. I just did uh, Boondock Saints, right? You get this. The, the, I've seen this so many times with my friends. They'll say like a movie they did. And somebody, oh, yeah, that's great. I saw that. It was wonderful. This is what you get sometimes when you uh, say you did Boondock Saints. <laughs> you did Boondock Saints. <laughs> all of a sudden, all of, like, like, they don't believe you. They, they put you through a test. Say the prayer. You know the fucking prayer. And they, they can repeat it right to you. And they're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Bloop. Joey. Joey. You're never going to fucking believe it. It's just like it's a whole different it's, it's a, a whole different thing with Boondock. People have taken this one so personally and it so makes weird. my heart sore every time, you know? It's, I get the best goddamn fans ever. There was this one article that a critic wrote and it was I think it was entitled something like Don't Ever Criticize Boondock Saints in a Bar. You almost got <laughs> ass kicked by a bunch of fans, surrounded him, and started reciting the prayer. <laughs> Like a cult, like a cult. <laughs> it's like it, it was. They, get, they are a randy fucking lot, man. And when I remember being with Rocco when we we heard, he's the one that found the article and sent it to me, and he was just laughing his ass off. He's like, "There's gotta be a way to, you know, send them off to. You, can, do we have like an assassination squad? <laughs> like anybody that fucks with us, can we just send them there to deal with it?" Uh, I was like, "I don't know, but wow." It's, you know, and it's so fascinating, man, because Boondock has this kind of lore about it. And you're absolutely right. Out of all the films that came out in the in the 90s and early 2000s, let's say that because you're part of that that group of of, of, of crop of filmmakers from 1989 to, 19, to 2001, 2002, that kind of crew. There aren't, in my understanding, any films in that time period that have the level of fandom that you know because look we all know el mariachi well clerks i would argue clerks but no one's beating anybody up over clerks um mm -hmm. um you know they're not fighting over you know they're not you know they're not like what did you say what did you say about the star the death star what like it doesn't happen but there's a there's a different level of passion i feel with boondock and i've seen it dude i've seen i've seen the tats i've seen all all of that dude it's like it is it is go it goes deep and what what do you think that is dude i mean i know the story is really you know, there's a religious, almost a religion aspect to it, almost. I would boil it down to two things, but it, it's almost to the, you could do it to each individual, you mm -hmm. know, and ask them that question. You might get a different answer, but I think it comes down to two things. Uh, brotherhood. People love movies about brothers and people have brothers and sisters. Blood. Mm -hmm. And when you see Connor and Murphy chew through a brick wall to save each other or back mm -hmm. each other or kill somebody or survive together as blood and family. That plays into it. Also, you know, the, the best friend aspect of it. We've all, the, Rocco is almost like that, that stereotypical friend everybody had in high school. It was like a puppy dog, down for anything, loyal as hell. Even though he couldn't fight, if you got in a fight, he was going to jump in and get his ass kicked. <laughs> you know? All right. So everybody had that. The other part of it, I think, is just the slight adjustment on a theme. We all had seen vigilante movies and the superhero themed movies forever. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the vigilante movies, uh, we, we, you know, it's almost like you need to have personally offended me that I'm going to come after you or a group of people. I'm going to mow them down one by one because you killed my family. Batman, right. <laughs> our, little, our little, you know, like, yeah, like, uh, like it's Charlie Bronson stuff. Yeah, Punisher, know? Charlie Bronson, uh, Batman, yeah. all those guys, yeah. The adjustment that I made was you don't need to have personally offended Connor and Murphy. They're killing you because you're a bad person, and that's it. But they're doing it in this way where there's belief and faith wrapped into it. Right. So I believe that young people that were watching that at that time who may have, you know, uh, I think that the young people watching at that time saw that aspect of it. These are two boys following their moral code. Now, you can believe they're just badass vigilantes 
Irish guy is fucking killing it, or you can believe they were sent by God, it doesn't really matter. What they're doing essentially is protecting us, protecting mm -hmm. society. And I think that was that one little adjustment that we hadn't seen before that really got into people. Because if you think about it, you know, if you and your friend or you and your brother were going to do a similar thing, you would do exactly what, if you, uh, you know what, we're going to kill the bad people, the true threats to our community. We're mm -hmm. going to kill them. What you would do is you'd go get guns, try to shoot them in the head and get away with it and not get caught. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. So it seemed also there was a, just a kind of reasonableness and logic to it. That, of course. You know, this would this would happen if it. So I, I think that those are like in a very general, wide, broad sense. Uh, those were one of the reasons the, the, the it was a probably a, a, a good part of the reason why Boondock struck a chord so deeply with people. But I think if you ask those people, you'll get a different you'll get a different fucking thing from each. One sure. It, it, yeah. It's, uh, movies are always something to everybody else. But I was just curious what you thought, because there is there's something visceral. In it, there's there's no question. There's something very visceral in the reaction that people have to that film. Either you love it or you hate it. There is generally not a gray with with Boondock. Yeah, it's yeah. it's generally like eh, it's okay. No, no, you love it or you hate it. It's one and of those. I, two. You know what? It's, it's really fun too because that frustrated the the we we critically just smashed to pieces, but mm -hmm. the fans just loved it. So critics who would you know do i even think i saw kurt loader say something about this on on mtv <laughs> wow go, going back so, going back so set and they just couldn't be like why do you all love this movie so much <laughs> i'm a critic and i know what good movie making is and this sucks why does everybody <laughs> like it oh well you know and it was like okay and that happened so many times you know <laughs> it was like it became a joke for all of us afterwards. It's like, hey, so the guy love hated us, and uh, that's it. Right. Now, when you were, dude, when you were going back on that, I'm gonna, I just want to go back real quick to the first day on set for for Boondock, the first one. You're yeah. you, you first time you're directing, right? First time you're on set. Um, right. you've gone through hell and back to get. I mean, more than most filmmakers, because making any movie is hell. <laughs> at, at almost any level but you yeah. really have a, a documented journey <laughs> of, yeah. of hell and back so you're yeah. there on your first day dude and you're working with you know amazing actors how do you feel man how do you like take it on are you just like relieved to get going or are you nerd like what is it anxious to get going anxious to get going but by that point i mean i had grown up with this sort of east coast mentality in terms of uh, you, you go out there you put in your day's work hard you earn your money you know, right, right. so I was going to I was going to earn this. I, I realized how much time and money we had. I was keeping my eye on the ball. And uh, what I did was just get through that day as hard as possible. And, and that first day is where I started to earn the faith of my cast and crew. You know, right. I remember uh, this one time was going up and I was uh, going on set. I was stopped by a PA and told that I couldn't come out. He had no idea who I was. You know, I had overalls on. I didn't blame the kid. I, I, he wouldn't have known. But mm -hmm. once we got, you know, once we had a nice funny ha ha, got mm -hmm. our coffees in us, it was like get to work. Right, know? right. And I realized, you know, just from you just you know, maybe from like sports and playing things like hockey and stuff and how you can deal with actors is almost like a coach deals with players in, in a lot of ways. But just know you're each individual player guy like Defoe. He liked to get inside of a room and feel the spatialness of it, walk around, mumble his lines. And I would always kind of clear everybody out and give him some time. And, and then we were able to riff. And this is a guy you approach, you know, you're about to get something out of him that's going to make what you had on the page way better. Mm -hmm. You know, what, uh, uh, you know, maybe when I'm dealing with the brothers, uh, sometimes it's just like a coach psyching you up for the big game. That's what they need in the moment. So, you know, I guess I'll probably go into that uh, on my upcoming disastrous social media thing. <laughs> but I'm going to start doing videos and telling those stories. But it's it, you, when an actor walks off feeling like they just got something good, they just did right. a great job, and they're right. walking on air, they just simply begin to trust you, and everything goes, goes smooth from there. And when, uh, you know, uh, guys that have been like, you, you're, you say your key grip in this business has been in the business forever. And the guy is a legend. Ours mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knows <laughs> great directors. And, and you know, at the bar that night after day one, if he's going, hey, I just signed off on you with everyone. You know that you're, you're getting there, you know. Right. And 
then it just started to ramp up. By the time we were done shooting, nobody wanted to go home. Everybody wanted this film to continually shoot. <laughs> As a, like a series. <laughs> yeah, turn into a TV, TV series. Screw the movie. Right. Just keep it all here and shooting because we were all having such a fun time. And all the way from an actor to wardrobe people to hair people to food people, they all saw almost instant gratification for their work right there on set because they were invested in the characters. And they were invested. This new guy, David Delarocco, they didn't know who he was. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, the wardrobe ladies cried off, off, just off set when they watched his death scene. And I remember coming by, I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Didn't realize what was going on. And they're like, no, it's fine, it's fine. And they were actually hurt that he mm-hmm. was fake dying on screen, you know? Wow. And the, that, one of those moments where you're like, ooh, ooh, what's, what the fuck is happening here? What do I have here? Because mm-hmm. that doesn't happen. You know? No, it doesn't. And a lot of other things like that. There's so many stories that I, I have to share with the fans who have been waiting a long fucking time. So I, I got to ask you, though, man. I think you kind of touched upon this earlier, man, that, you know, you obviously are an accomplished filmmaker. You're obviously a good storyteller and a good director. You've made two, you know, le- like almost legendary mythical movies that people just adore who've done big business. Why haven't there have been other opportunities. Why haven't there been other projects? Are you are you still leaning? Is it still a spillover from the Harvey Blacklist bullshit, or is it just? Or, <laughs> is it the doc? I'm, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, everybody's all upset about what I did to Harvey. No, <laughs> oh, the, that poor man. That How poor, you treat poor him like that. <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 definitely spill. Documentary still haunts, and I think that was kind of looked at as a. Uh, I let I let I made the cardinal sin of letting them backstage and airing Hollywood laundry when it wasn't really me. I think it's also a lot of misunderstanding, you know, like, oh, my God, that maniac. Well, what's happened? Is he all right? Is he even doing anything? Um, and but like I said, there are my pockets of fans. So, yeah, this whole thing has affected me. It has not necessarily uh, put me in the in the best light at, say, uh, I, I, I'm not popular with the Chicago Police Department. <laughs> there, there are places where I'm not popular, you know, sure. and they don't want me around them or the, you know, their projects or anything. And then there are other places where there are guys that were turned fan, you know, right out of college that are now running some big shit. And they're like, Duffy, get over here. Right. And, you know, so it's, it's gone up and down. I, I'm going to try and, you know, turn myself into a movie making machine. Good, over the next uh, bunch of years, I, I I feel I've accumulated enough knowledge and experience in this business to really be of value. We're going to start out, you know, hopefully with a uh, uh, part three, uh, which we can talk about in a minute. But mm-hmm. in terms of other projects, yeah, I have been writing my ass off with a whole bunch of stuff. Two, I'd like to mention in particular. Mm-hmm. One, we're trying to put together during this COVID um, this COVID time because there's a there's an opportunity potentially in Australia. One of my um, Dear friends and producers, something we uh, we did, a, somebody, we, we already pulled one off during COVID. Mm-hmm. I didn't even tell you about that. A guest house. Boom. Pauly Shore, our boy Pauly Shore. Yeah. I, I wrote and produced it with my uh, my friends, Sean Bishop and uh, Sam Macaroni, who directed it. Mm-hmm. And we were the number one comedy uh, in America on iTunes. <laughs> we were number seven on iTunes. It's, again, it's like this thing that happens quiet, you know? If, if all this hadn't been happening, you know, it would have been like on <laughs> so balance. It's oh, like, God. I can't. I can't walk the streets in Bulgaria. I can't. I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm big in Japan, bro. I'm huge. I'm huge uh, in Japan. I can't walk the streets in Japan. <laughs> so it was this zany movie. We did that, uh, and it was really good. Paul, Paul, I'm really proud of Paulie. He really killed it. It's sort of a comeback performance. Nobody's yeah. seen Paulie in a while, and yeah. he's just amazing. I love Paulie, man. Love <laughs> we did a movie about, like, essentially it's about um, a guy living in a guest house, and this couple buys the house, tries to get him out, and he won't leave. So it's like War of the Roses, but we, we we did it. Sam was a great director. It was a wonderful producing experience for me. But my my guy uh, Scott Clayton uh, helped finance that, and he's out of Australia. And uh, the reason we even knew each other was because of this other script I'd written called The Blood Spoon Council. Now, what that script is is essentially about a group of serial killers, uh, of, of of hunters of serial killers led by a mastermind profiler, one they call a one percenter profiler, that goes out into the world, identifies, snatches, 
executes serial killers and delivers them to the doorstep of the FBI. And so the FBI is covertly looking for them and can't let the fact that they are out there murdering U.S. citizens mm-hmm. at random get out because it would be way too bad. You know, because once people found out that they were serial killers, they might be like, just like Boondock, aren't they doing your job for you? Aren't you guys <laughs> supposed to be doing that? And so, then now, and now you have the FBI pissed off at you as well. Extremely, <laughs> extremely dark thing and uh-huh. i put in about two years of, of research into serial wow. before i put pen to paper on it with my buddy chris lassiter uh who helped me on the in, in the writing duties with it but as soon as it hit this uh wonderful company called the uh, grindstone over at lionsgate mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know they were like get in here turns out again these were fans of mine these guys had gone through other companies and while boondock was happening they were keeping an eye on it they were saying things like we got to get a movie with this guy back in the day Mm-hmm. So when I got in there, I realized that they, they told you they, they give you these stories. This is your, this is how your film affected me. One of them was a young guy who I got in college. One of them was already in the business over at some huge company that I, escapes me now. Right. The other one was this. You know, they, they they all had their 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 Duffy story, and they all threw them on me. I was like, this is great. And then they were like, we read the script, and oh my god, and they put me right on the. Conference call with Clayton. Here's the guy, money guy. We want to get moving on this right away. Now, this was this is how you know hard these things are to put together. You'd think you'd have a well-heeled company like that uh, uh, willing to pick up the the domestic rights for however many million, a mm-hmm. financier coming in for all the rest of it that they've worked with on ten, a bunch of other movies. You think this is going to get done quickly? It doesn't. You know, until all the lines that are dotted are signed, you got nothing. But here we all made the college try, and now we're trying again during COVID because there's a potential opportunity in Australia. Uh, but we're trying to get that one off the ground. That's one of those, uh, you know, you must have it too, like that project, your, your little Oh, I've got a couple. Drawer. Yeah, I, I just put, I spit shine it every now and then. Pull it out, update it when it needs to be. And, and now we, we've got some opportunity to po- potentially pull one off because really the story is, is a cat and mouse game mm-hmm. between yeah. the mastermind profiler for the council and this kid that the FBI brings in who is also a one percenter who doesn't really like the idea of what <laughs> these guys are doing but is so curious about this guy. You know, who's not going to be? They're like, you know, he's like, you know, these guys have pulled down seven serial killers in the last five years. You guys get like what? One One a decade. (laughs) (laughs) And he has to virtually walk through the front door. You know, you you want you really want to catch these guys kind of thing, you know. So it it becomes (laughs) really, really awesome Uh, to me. You know, one of the one of the more well-researched and exciting projects, as long as we can find people that can deal with the darkness, because. You know, you don't do you don't do Silence of the Lambs, you know, without Hannibal Lecter and you don't you don't give uh, Clarice a dog to make her more sympathetic. It, you you got to You got to go there with with stuff like that. And these days, you know, there's kind of a real the real violence and the real darkness. There may they're kind of pulling back on that now. And I think it's affecting storytelling in the industry. And I, I fucking hate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's well the whole thing with COVID, man. I and mean, that's the other thing I want to tell you. Well, first of all, by the way, can't wait to see that movie. Um, mm. Dying to see that. That sounds absolutely remarkable. Um, mm. And I'm so I'm so glad that that there are these fans of people that have gone through the system and grew up with you. It's like it sounds like we're old farts. You know, it's like it's like we're like, hey, you know, when I was a kid, your movie really did. I look at a much, much, much smaller level. I get it with a film I did in two thousand five that people constantly re- would come back to me on, like, oh, I bought that movie. Uh, it, it was a short film. It was a short film. It's a short film called a short film called Broken. But what I did in that movie, in that little DVD, I threw three and a half hours of how to make a movie with a DVX 100A Final mm-hmm. Cut Pro, when nobody had any information about making movies. If you oh, remember, wow. 2005, yeah. there was no YouTube. There was no information. Yeah, yeah. And that that little movie, people, I constantly get emails about that. And it's still, when I meet people at, at events or something, like, dude, and they'll bring out the original DVD. Oh, I'm wow. like, oh, oh wow. Cow. So I, at a much, much, much smaller level than you do, I still get that kind of stuff too. And I it's just like, uh, go ahead. It's cool that you had that you're trying to help out vibe. I mean, you probably were like, hey, this is how to do it, guys. You know? Yeah. I'm no. having that that instinct now. That's exactly what I'm <laughs> going to be going and doing. Like, hey, Good. this is how I did it, guys. And this is how you can do it. 
Uh, and that's like a that's like during this COVID time, man, I, the, I, I look at it like the depression is probably the big culprit here. You know, you're seeing mm-hmm. murders go up. Uh, you're seeing suicides through the roof. Yep. Right. Depression yep. is the culprit. And I've noticed, you know, even if you don't think you're having it, I've noticed like I have like different reactions to things than I would have normally. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and or, or I'm like experimenting. I'll be like, you know, what would happen if I ate nothing but carrots for three days? <laughs> what would what would that fucking do in here? <laughs> you know, and I did. And I, essentially, you want meat so bad <laughs> to take a bite of a fellow human being. Um, you know those. You know what Scorsese? Scorsese made an iPhone short film, quarantine short film. Um, during like the height of the quarantine, like after it was like a month or two, like when the world was shut, like literally shut down, like when nothing was moving, okay. he shot one of them yeah. and it was like this weird, like, you know, he's projecting stuff on his face and it's like this whole weird, like it's, it's, it's basically if Scorsese made a quarantine film on his iPhone, whatever's in your head, that's what he shot. <laughs> Artists should not be left alone to their own devices. <laughs> We it's, are complete idiots. We can't take it. It's insanity. Oh, God. Even the other day, I, I, I clicked on YouTube and typed in uplifting videos. <laughs> what the fuck? Because it's a look. There's a, there's been so much. Look, man, there's been so much. This last year has been horrible for the world. It's been devastating for the world. The psychological I, and I and I've been telling this to people for a lo- for a while now, and I've said it on the show a bunch of times. There is going to be a hangover. A COVID hangover that the society is going to have, not only in the world, but like for films. Like, I don't know when I'm going to be able to go back to a movie theater and truly feel comfortable in a group environment or go to a film festival and just like be like Sundance, like be in Sundance. Like, I can't even, oh. I can't even think about handshakes. Yeah. Handshakes. D from the shit. You know? Like, handshakes. Like, handshakes. I, I don't even know if I'll ever handshake somebody again. I think the elbow thing is the closest thing I'm going to do for a while. It's crazy, but there is it's it's really a serious thing that's happening to to humans and us as artists we're bouncing off the damn walls in here. I know, I know dude. I had the funniest <laughs> interaction. If you had been with me, I, you would have you just laughed your ass off. There were kind of staples. I'm going to save the story all of it, but I had a reaction. You know those guys that uh you know how staples are just huge. They're gigantic warehouse. I go in there, and uh, there's maybe two employees. There's there's two <laughs> other there's two other customers. I'm walking around with a stupid mask on. Right. I hate I hate this goddamn thing. Right. And all I have to buy is is uh, Velcro and rubber bands. It's the only reason I'm there. Sure. You ever see one of these guys in like a supermarket? They're like. Hey, yeah, what did he say? What? Did he... <laughs> there was a dude being so loud. It was bouncing off the walls. Oh, my God. And I did something that I'm going to preserve for my own website. But Fair it enough. is not how I would have reacted in any normal situation. You know, right. I realized walking out of there that something's something's kind of wrong here. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not reacting the way I normally would. And as a director, you have to have been in that position mm-hmm. where things going wrong. The whole world's coming down and you have to be calm. You can't look for who made the mistake and try and get them. You can't take, you have to take all the blame yourself mm-hmm. and just keep pushing it forward. Always been good at that. But this, you know, the, there's a part of, of maybe my personal depression that offends that very core area of mine, mm-hmm. and I am. Not, I find myself not reacting in similar ways that I I, 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 don't know myself anymore. Just a little bit here and there, and it sends you those cues, like just like little lightning bolts. Yeah. Well, you don't do that. You don't do. It may have been funny, you know. It may have been fun to do, but you don't do that. You don't act like that. Right. You know? You are the you are the the sort of rock of calm in the middle of that stuff, and now it just doesn't take too much doesn't take too much to rile you or me anyway. Just speaking for myself, but yeah, I really wish, you know, that there was maybe that's what we can do with uh, uh, Indie Hustle Academy. Yeah, you know, bunch of, get a bunch of artists together to talk about their depression during this and why and how. Man, what they I'm all- even combat it you know i have my little techniques and they they work most of the time but it's 
nobody's talking about it, bro. I've been I've been lucky enough because I I'm I'm constantly talking to people, interviewing people, talking all the time to people like yourself, and constantly. So I, during this entire time, I've had human interaction, and I'm home with my family and stuff. But I've yeah. had human interaction, and I can talk things out. But I can't imagine just being locked up. Like I can't just watch t- I, I, the days of me sitting down and watching ten hours of, of of movies. I can't I can't do that anymore. I know, and even I when even can't. when you can go out, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you from a man cave in, 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 in old town Pasadena, mm-hmm. all right? One of my favorite spots on earth. And when you walk around here, and there's just nobody, it's a ghost town, mm-hmm. you know? You, uh, it's a ghost town, and it, it, uh, all the businesses are shut down. They're, they're starting to open up now, but like I had a couple of months ago, I had the experience of jogging right down the main strip. I may have seen four people the whole time. Mm-hmm. I get busted by a cop for jaywalking. Because he's got nothing else better to do with his life. He's got zero. To, you could hear the tumbleweeds in the background while this guy was writing me the ticket. I was almost like, really? Really? This, this seems like a good idea to you. There is no one around here. There's no wow. one around here. There was no cars, too, because it was really early in the morning, you know, and I, I was just super like, you know, what, what, what are you doing? I think it's even affecting cops. You know? <laughs> oh, no, of course. Like, I can't give tickets anymore because there's nobody to give tickets to. <laughs> yeah, there's a guy right there. I'm going I'm I'm to get, get back to being an officer. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> that was a good Jim Carrey. That was a very good Jim Carrey. Excuse me. The pen is blue. <laughs> the I, w- pen is blue. I would like to ask you a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, um, first of all, I, I, um, I, I, I want to thank you so much for being so brutally honest, raw, setting this record straight on everything that's happened to you in your career and where you're going, which is a question I know a lot of people who are your fans want to know. Like, when's Boondock? Oh, yeah, Boondock Saints 3. When's that happening? Mm-hmm. I want to tell you about one thing first. Okay. Like if you include this quick project, uh, yeah. there's always kind of writing writing projects on the you know uh, on the horizon. That's one of the nice things to, to kind of keep you going. And um, uh, we're trying to. Uh, there's this really cool one right now. I remember that this uh, there's a producer named um, uh, Daniel McNichol and Scott Raleigh. They're out of this place called Galatia Films in uh, in in Hot Atlanta. Mm-hmm. They uh, again producers that were fans. You know, mm-hmm. uh, can you take a look at this script? Uh, and it was a script called uh, Glastonbury about uh, Christ. Uh, uh, there, there's a legend, basically, a legend uh, uh, that said Joseph, his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, mm-hmm. took him to Great Britain, to this place called Glastonbury when he was in his teens. Cause, so Christ was there. Right. There's all this kind of evidence in the local area for it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the story is based on this legend. So it was extremely well researched. I read it. I liked it. And then they basically say, you know, we are in a bit of a pickle here because we need to bust this into a trilogy. We want to do more of a sort of Lord of the Rings trilogy. And uh, funny thing, I had always had this kind of thing, that question you have in your, well, like, what happened after Christ died, mm-hmm. rose from the dead? What happened then? Because all those biblical all-stars was still alive. Mm-hmm. His mom, uh, uh, all the uh, apostles, but Joseph, say, yeah. of course, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, his, uh, his uncle, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, everybody was still there. What did they do? <laughs> you know? yeah, like, what happened? Did, did they, they, did they yeah, Netflix what? and chill? I know. I mean, yeah, what did they Netflix and chill? So I always had this idea about, you know, a, a, a sort of uh, a historical fantasy a uh, story about Christ's all stars going out into the world after he was gone, and they got this cup, which ends up being the most supernatural thing on earth that can change the tides of war and men and nations. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of put it right over this idea and said, "Look, here's how we go big, you know, uh, without going to you know wizards and dragons." Mm-hmm. And give something that people are tangible that will have, you know, that if we move out into the world with Christ all stars and they've got the Holy Grail and it starts showing itself and they realize that they're seeing these very powerful things happening. And this thing is it can be everything from something that that saves you to a weapon 
Mm-hmm. You know, very dangerous. How dare God put this power in our hands, the hands of men? You know, so I thought, great. I so we made the pitch during COVID. It was like right here, you know, uh, 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 Zoom Zoom call pitch, and they loved it. So we're trying <laughs> to make that deal right now. So that is a potentially upcoming project for for Troy. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Now you want to get to three? Boondocks, what? yeah, Boondock Three. Yeah, what happened? What's going? When's going on with Boondock? Because I'm sure there's a few people who want to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah uh so all right you know how it is in the business i can't tell you what will happen tomorrow on that no and one nothing's happening until all the dotted lines are signed and mm-hmm. this is kind of what where i wanted to maybe segue into what's happening with independent film especially mm-hmm. budget levels and and the, the types of independent film that boondock is yeah uh, um, we can talk about that in a second let's pair that one off but what's happening with boondock is uh, that script, there was a long and winding road to crack the code on that script. And I knew that I had to kind of get it right. And so I brought in a couple of, uh, writers who have been friends of mine for 25 years. I know the brand very well. And once I got to a certain point, we all started bouncing it. And over the last year and a half, I'd say we got it and, uh, it is done. And I'm talking so hot off the presses, but it's days we have to put it through one or two more um, stages creatively. Mm-hmm. You know, like, mm-hmm. I need to hear it out loud. I need to hear that read out loud. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, with all the accents and everything. I need to then p- kind of pop it through this whole final phase that I can tell uh, my fans about later on. But mm-hmm. um, it is at that phase. The 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 pro the the. The problem with getting it done uh, lies in in the scheduling and uh, availability, and the fact that there's COVID has virtually ended uh, the production of all films almost on this level. At any time, at this time, two years ago, there would have probably been th- uh, hundreds in the industry, if not thousands, privately of independent films at that budget level being shot. And when you say budget level, you're talking in the five to ten million. Yeah, we'll say five to fifteen. Five to fifteen, got it. Uh, and uh, so. I, I needed to get a solid foundation uh, on that script. I needed to have it feel more towards a, a sort of deeper, darker Boondock One. Mm-hmm. And it, we finally did. There's also this kind of odd, timely thing that, that happened with it. It kind of has some things to do with what's happening now in our society, so it's even more tangible. I love what we got. I love this script. It's awesome. So we're going to try to move out with that. Here's one of the major problems. Uh, yeah, COVID has really, really hurt independent film. Uh, what, what's happening now is that the, uh, one of the reasons very few things, uh, even big budget, are being shot and done, uh, that, that um, the production has virtually stopped and only these really big streamers can handle it is because of an insurance issue. I've been involved in these talks for a long time. And they cannot find anybody that's going to write COVID insurance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. The people that are shooting right now usually are self-insuring because they're, they're wealthy enough and well-heeled enough companies to financially self-insure, which is your Amazons, your Netflix, your Hulus, the ones who can afford to self-insure. But here's what it means, what it would mean for an independent filmmaker. If I've got, say, a million dollars to go make my, let's, let's make it even numbers, $5 million to make my film. Uh, no, let's make it 10 million. Yeah, I'm, I'm so great with math. Let's make it $10 million to go make my film. Now, 25% of it goes away. Right, right. Right to COVID protection on set. They're doing these crazy things with pods where a whole all your, uh, say, uh, wardrobe people will actually never be in a room with your grips and electric people who will never have any physical contact with uh, the top level producers and director of video village over here. Mm-hmm. They are literally and if one person comes down with COVID in the pod. They remove everybody, put a whole new pot of people in there. It's extremely expensive. It is financially debilitating. Yeah. But especially to independent films. That ends us right there for now. It'll be fixed. We'll come back. But there is no way. I mean, you're already on a tight budget historically, and you know this just as well as I do. You've been through this many times. 
that every single cent plus hopefully a rebate if you that's yeah. your finishing cost we know how to make these things with the money that we're given we know what's possible and not possible i know i have to give up that great location for this good one because it saves me this money that i need for this mm -hmm. that's how we do independent films to have something that comes in from which you get zero benefit that sucks up 25% of your budget, just gone, burned in flames, mm -hmm. ends you. And they're usually kind of privately financed or financed by companies that really like to get their money back. <laughs> right. Those people are going to, those people right now are going, 25, I got to pay 25% mm -hmm. right out the door for this crap. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't put 25% more on the screen You're, at all. Yeah. It's and you don't get it back. You don't get it back at all in any way unless the, the movie makes so much money that everybody's happy, right. you know, but they're not they're just not doing it. So that that really does play in. You know, I, I, I another thing that can make you depressed is going like the state of my business. This is what I do, man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The state of my business is is going down in flames right now. It is really it's really hurting. It's really on its knees. And um, yeah, it scares it scares me. I'm scared uh, of that. I, I want to see it come back and bounce back with full vigor. And I know it's going to. Well, it will. It will. You can't you can't keep something like independent film or creatives down or it, it just the business model has to change. It has to adjust. The, you know, you know, as well as I do, those budgets have been coming down, 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 down. Studios are only doing 80 to 250 million dollar movies. They're not even touching and and the and the and the five to fifteen is is almost no man's land. It's a rough it's a rough number, you know. It's uh, really happening. I've heard, I've I've heard of one film that has right. happened. Right, but but it's a, I mean you're talking about a, a sequel to two very successful, almost legendary films. So it, yeah. it wouldn't make sense in that budget range to to kind of make that next movie. But dude, I agree with you. I think it will come back. It is it is brutal. I talk to filmmakers every day. I talk to the big guys, I talk to the little guys, I talk to everything in between, and everyone's having problems. Everyone. Yeah. People that yeah. you you would, you know, who've been on my show, who've won Oscars, and they're like, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I can't, uh, I can't get that. <laughs> and, I, and then I, you know, privately I'd be like, so, can't get a movie made. so if you can't get a movie made, <laughs> yeah. well, what, what is the chance of me or Troy <laughs> getting our stuff off the ground? <laughs> you know, like it's, 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 but that's the reality of our business and everyone's having a problem. So now it's really, honestly, man, this is when, you know, all that shrapnel is going to come in handy because guys like you and me have been able to survive at yeah. this, at this world where the larger guys who've been more comfortable, you know, they're like, how much did you make? You made that movie for 5 million. I don't even know how to make a movie for 5 million. And then like my last movie I made for 3000 bones. And and got rele and got released and all this stuff and people are like, their minds just freaking explode with yeah. that, you know. So it's just like, it's it, it, the hustle, the the, the hustle, the hustle, <laughs> the hustle, oh, oh. the hustle. If I may, if I may what? plug Alex, the word, Alex Ferrari, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> By the way, you fucked out with your last name, for What the? Hi, yeah. It's Troy Porsche coming at you with his buddy Alex. Duffy's not bad, Sorry. dude. Duffy's not bad. Duffy's not bad. Uh, no, man, but... I, I, I get you because, I mean, I know that we're going to come... Sometimes you have to have this odd kind of faith. I know is as depressed as you, you can be right now, as depressed as I have been, mm -hmm. in the, in, and as, as in under the threat uh, that our business is in, mm -hmm. I know that we, guys like me and you, and all those filmmakers, you have other filmmakers, that we're going to come back 10 times stronger. Yeah. We, all the le we're not even done learning the lessons from this, but the ones we will are going to carry us forward and make us do probably better work. I mean, there's nothing that makes you want it and appreciate it more, like having it snatched away from you and you can't do it anymore. And that has felt like, you know, I've always been shooting something. I've always been doing something. And then this. And But I think is honestly, dude, sometimes you need, I think, and it's, you can see this throughout history, you've got to go into the dark phase. I mean, the dark ages, what came out of the dark ages, the renaissance. Yes. Yeah, and that's, and that's right. light. The greatest artistic move, uh, period in, in, in history. In human history. So I'm feeling that hopefully something like that will happen for independent film. I mean, the 90s was an explosion of creativity. And the, I think the, the, the landscape is different. And there's so many things, different things than it was in the 90s and when we were coming up. But there's something new that we can't even see yet. 
that's going to be big. And I think that there will be hope. There will be light at the end of this tunnel. But it's all about now just – look, I, and I say this all the time, dude. I say this all the time, and I think you'll agree with me 100%. No matter who you are in this business, I don't care if you're Steven Spielberg, Troy Duffy, Alex Ferrari, anybody, you're going to get just jacked in the face by this business all the time. It happens at every level and at every stage of your career. More at the beginning, but you could also get it at the end. The difference is what I try to do with Indie Film Hustle and with everything that I do is I warn you that the punch is coming because a lot of people are just walking around like, hey, man, man. boom, done, out. You're, and you're gone. They're, and they're gone. They're gone from the business because they're knocked out because they didn't even know it was coming. And they're like, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this shit. And they're out. <laughs> I'm warning you that it's coming and you're going to get hit. And it's about getting hit. It's like Rocky says. It's about getting hit and keep moving forward. And then occasionally, as these gray hairs start popping out, like you and I have, these little grays, hey, I, oh, yeah. th- these little grays start popping out, you oh, yeah. start to learn how to duck a bit. Mm-hmm. You learn how to, you, you still might get hit, but you learn how to take that hit a little differently. You learn how to move. And occasionally, you get so good that you can just see them coming, and you just start bobbing and weaving, and you don't get nearly hit as much. But those yeah. punches will always keep coming. And the people, and the th- people throwing the punches give up <laughs> and, and stop trying to punch you. They're like, that guy's just too good. Fuck it. Right. It's like it's like it's like it's Muhammad. Over. It's like Ali Ali at his at his at his top. You yeah. like you couldn't. You, you We're could not touch putting him. this guy in the mat anymore. We did at the beginning, you know. You know, <laughs> the, you know the glory days when he first yelled action. He was like, "Oh, it's such a special day, everybody!" And action. <laughs> you're out, and and you're out. He's yeah, out those for the days are over. Those days are over. You're not gonna. <laughs> he's learned how to block. Exactly. But I think we'll all come out of this, man. Um, it's it's a tough time. Uh, we've been in tough times before. This is unprecedented tough times. This is one yeah. in a once in a generation situation. But I do believe that something good will come out of it, man. It has to. I have to believe that to keep moving forward. <laughs> I, I I have to too. But just think about all the other times that that we've been hit in this business with whatever. You know, even mm-hmm. just during the Columbine, they, that's when they first started discussing real censorship. And mm-hmm. actually self-censoring. And it all came back. You know, we've gone through dark parts of this business. You know, there, there's been the, like lately, the, the, everybody, the, the, uh, what, what happened to uh, Kevin Spacey? You mm-hmm. know, people being exposed in the... Uh, and at the Harvey. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Harvey. Yeah, I can't believe I used Kevin Spacey. <laughs> I, had to, well, I had that one right in front of me. I mean, it's, ca- it's called getting Weinsteined. I mean, it's literally, he is now, he's, Ooh, wow. he, he's an adjective. I mean, you know what's really funny? I put that in a script yesterday. I'm doing this horror film. This guy's explaining to this girl how she's a wonderful actress, and she probably won't even have to get Weinstein during production. Wow! I did last night, it's weird, but yeah, it, yeah, but exactly. You know, but it, it, it's a word now. Business, business, and the people in it. You know, we have taken a lot of punches in a lot of different ways. Yeah, man. And and rolled through it and came out the other side smiling. We have to have faith in that. I do. Uh, it's just that you know. I also understand we are still having, we're still learning things right now. It's almost like we should, well, like after all the, the vaccines uh, get everybody vaccinated, we start to return to normal. We should come back here, you know, maybe parse this one off for the academy or something. Come back here and say, okay, we talked about it on March 12th, 2001. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the things we were learning, now it's March 12th. 2022 we're through it what did we learn where right. are we at yeah amen amen now i'm going to ask you bro because we could keep going for at least another three hours and i know we can um <laughs> and we and we might another day but i'm just going to ask you a few questions i ask all my guests what okay. advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today uh, to, to me one of the 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 key skills a filmmaker needs uh, if you because uh, you can go and take the classes, you know, you can go to, to film school and learn how to run cameras and become very proficient at that. But actually successful filmmaking takes another kind of thing. It takes another kind of talent. Uh, to me, it comes in two ways. One can almost be addressed as uh, you have to know. I mean, you'd be surprised how many people in Hollywood can put down a script and just be like, well, what did you think? Uh, you have to know what great writing it is. If you just read something, right? That you have to know and go get, whether that kid is a dishwasher or the best 
Fucking a bouncer, a bouncer at a bar in L.A. Sure, <laughs> bar in L.A. Uh, <laughs> you got to go get them. You got to secure that property because mm -hmm. it's the stories that mean something. You know, I could have filled my first independent film with movie stars. It wouldn't have been so independent. It probably wouldn't have had the impact that it had now. One of the things that told me that I was a good and real filmmaker was. I took the chance and risk to do it. I put my faith in the story, and then you all told me, "Good right. job." It yeah. had that effect on you, and I went, "Okay, yeah. all right." So that that skill, almost like always, have your head in a book. Know what good writing is. Know what good stories are. Mm -hmm. When you find the one, raise heaven and hell to get it, and do it, and do not stop until you're. Done. That was a, probably the number one piece of advice into being a filmmaker, which is a very specific thing, or being a successful or good one, which is a very specific thing. The other one is uh, we all have those friends, say in high school and college, the charismatic people that mm -hmm. can walk into a room and, you know, light the world on fire. You don't necessarily need to be one of those. But in dealing with actors, I mean, you, you will sometimes find a director that's a very great technical director that can pull off amazing shots. But then sometimes you'll see that his actor, the actors are, are sort of wooden in the scene. Mm -hmm. That's because that filmmaker hasn't put enough focus in that area. Getting into actors' heads or maybe joining kind of souls with them is, is, is candy ass as that sounded coming out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but knowing who they are, really being able to talk with them and see how they feel about something and really listen. And really respond because sometimes it doesn't go. It, it immediately has, sets up a red flag, you know. Like there was this time when I'm talking to Defoe, and he goes, he goes, uh, I feel like I should dance in this scene. And right away I'm going, you know, there's that alarm in, uh, uh, you know, and a, a bad filmmaker reacts like that would be, you know, that you can't do that because you, you're a cop and, and and take it off the table, <laughs> try to redirect him instead. I went, you know, that would be totally awesome, appropriate. But <laughs> you let's, know, let's just shoot it. Characters and inappropriate. So, we, and you know, Defoe's like, yeah, I know. Now you're in the sandbox with an actor. Now you just opened up that door. Right. You're two kids playing in a sandbox. This is that type of that. Figure out ways to truly connect with the actor that get them in it deeper, because you will always get something. Always get something better than it is on the page. Always. 100% of the time. And that does require you putting your own sensitivities and ego aside. You know, there's this, I, I hated this, but there was this, there was this, uh, there was a sort of attitude about me flowing forth from people, uh, not actors, from other mm -hmm. people on set that I was like this, you know, uh, John Houston type of a... <laughs> overly confident let's go kill it. mount up fellas mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's go kill it for everybody mm -hmm. and uh you can i you could be like that sometimes that's more cast and crew general leading his minions or uh, his uh, soldiers in, in ways but that wasn't i knew it was a lie mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you, you let it be said and you don't really if you comment but it was a lie what mm -hmm. what the real what the real nitty gritty of filmmaking is, is when an actor's got blood all over them and they're in the middle of a scene mm -hmm. and you help yell hold and you are still filming and you go down and whisper something right in their ear mm -hmm. and you make them understand and you feel their body shaking and you just go, go! And boom, you get something that you never thought possible because that person explodes in front of you. These are the things to me that make wise and good filmmakers. So, I that, guess was, that was that was arguably one of the best answers to that question ever, sir. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now I have to ask this question: is ask I ask this question to everybody. It's not just you, sir. Right. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether <laughs> in the film business or in life? I swear, it's almost on every episode on on my <laughs> show. We've been I, talking about that. This whole interview's been about that. I know, I know, but I just wanted to just I had to, because my fans, my, my my audience would just go. You didn't ask him the question. I'm like, I have to ask him. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> okay, that's uh, simple. You know, uh, you are. I am grateful. Be grateful for your mistakes. Amen. Your mistakes yeah. is what makes you uh, a better 
person and a better filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have made some doozies. <laughs> so now I am like the best person and the best filmmaker because I've made so many huge mistakes. Yeah. Uh, but know when, you know, another, another one would be know when to fight for something. Right. Uh, it's a series of compromises when you start to say make a film. You got producers over here yelling in your ear about the money. Yeah, uh, you got uh, actors yelling about the story. They want this, that, and the other. You have, need to know what to do. You need to know where to compromise. But then you need to know where to plant your flag. If you've done a bunch of compromising before you plant your flag and defend something, everybody knows, and it, it, you get what you want in those moments. Choose your battles wisely and make tons of compromise beforehand be a person that they tell on the phone to all the people they report to mm -hmm. yeah he's good to work with he gets it we got a good director here and then when you stick your heels in you dig your heels in they'll listen Amen. especially passionate about it and, and you don't do it like i did where you <laughs> <laughs> yell at everybody like, god damn it <laughs> don't you know no look, look I, I i we are our mistakes so again if a mobster shows up and wants to make a movie with me i'll say no <laughs> <laughs> and the next time two friends of mine say we want to do a documentary on you i'm gonna go no thank you <laughs> and mobster's thing you know next time someone asks you if you're in god uh, you, you say, say yes, yes. <laughs> And and scene, uh, <laughs> and scene. <laughs> and last question, man. Three of your favorite films of all time. Okay, uh, you'd have to go with Apocalypse Now for sure. Mm -hmm. Probably The Shining, but my but I would actually break that up into two categories. Because sure. You, your favorite indies of all time. And Fair your enough. Favorite, you know, big big one, big. Um, uh, you, you got your Apocalypse Nows. You have. Uh, Godfather, I, mm -hmm. I consider one and two one of the greatest you know, sequel type mm -hmm. things. Um, indies, I, I, I remember when I was a kid, the first one that hit me was, um, um, uh, why does it escape me right now? Chris Lambert, Highlander. Oh, the so first. I loved it. So loved it. Good. Oh, the so Queen, the Queen soundtrack, dude. Oh, you know? one. Yeah. Oh, so good. It's great. Uh, and then, uh, uh, strangely enough, dude, yeah, uh, number one independent of all time uh, is a film called Nil by Mouth. Have you ever seen Nil by Mouth? No. Okay, you're about to have the same experience I did. I'm not going to ruin it for you. Okay. It, don't look it up to see anything, anything. about it. Just Get go. A look it, put it in. Don't don't know directors, writers, who did it, what, how much it what's cost. The name, what's the name of it again? Nil by mouth okay it's an old english term where they used to hang over beds and triage units in, in world war one and two so that they couldn't receive medication orally okay all right i'll look it up i'll look it, up. it out and we should we should actually reconvene after you see that and do a little mini did you ever see the movie and this is an indie that i i always champion and it doesn't get talked about a lot man bites dog Love it. But see, again, cult classics. There's a difference between an indie and a cult classic. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a man by stars. Cut. Pigeon, pigeon. I loved that. Oh, movie. my God. So it good. So great. So good. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, like, but take the cult classics, because if you're going to actually do that, like, the, like I've seen I've seen awesome lists of like the, the most hard, the hardest indies of all time, you know, <laughs> the hard cores. And it's always boondock. Man bites dog, right. uh, a romper stomper, yeah. a couple other big ones, you know. Right. But the cult classics are a different story. They can be all over the place. If you, well, how similar is Boondock to say Rocky Horror Picture Show? No, no. Nothing. Or how, well, how, I mean, how similar I mean, is Rocky Horror to Man bites dog? Well, I mean, Nothing. Well, and also if we want to go down into cult classics, um, the worst movie ever made, The Room. I mean, is <laughs> I mean, it is. Uh -huh. One of it is a joy to watch it, but I only want to watch that with other people and preferably filmmakers because yeah. it's much, much more enjoyable to watch it than. Oh, and oh. and people have been asking me a lot to get Tommy on the show, and yeah. I'm I'm a bit. I met him. Is, I met him is he cool? Do. Is he a cool guy? It's it's odd. It's yeah. Odd. That's that's what I'm scared. I'm like, I'm a little like, how do you talk for an hour with this? like I like 
<laughs> from what I, the guy that introduced me to him was a friend of his, and yeah. uh, he's just, like, it just kind of depends on how you catch him, you know? Interesting. And I, I, I had heard that he he wanted to meet me, and he was all excited in the boondog. And when I met him, he was like, hey. I'm like, well, hey, I need <laughs> your... Uh, It was like nothing, you know. It was weird. I, it's, so, he, I, I, I'm kind of. I, I, he's fun just to have some fun and just do weird <laughs> shit. Just be like, to school or pack your lunch. <laughs> Hit him with fucking things that are gonna make him go. What? What? <laughs> I'll take that into consideration, sir. Um, dude, brother, man, thank you so much for being on the show, man. It has been an absolute joy talking to you, um, and I'm so glad I've been able to give you this place to kind of set the record straight on everything and. And uh, and hopefully this will be the beginning of, of you being out in social media now, talking yeah. a little bit more, sharing with the fans and all that stuff. So, brother, uh, thank you for doing what you do, man, and keep doing it. We need films like Boondock out there. We need voices like yours out in the marketplace and out into oh. cinema, man. So thank you, brother. All right. Next one is I'm um, working hard on three. Fans are going to get what they want. Thank you, my yeah. friend. They want. And thank you. And let's not make this our uh, – I'm, I'm kind of really interested in the whole – academy side and giving back and maybe getting some advice on i might send you shit before i release it just to <laughs> run it through the litmus test like what huge mistake did i make here alex and you'll be like oh god oh god what's the matter with you?